Big step. Thank you. That's a big, a big step. Uh, we're building a lot of wall right now. Uh, it started. A lot of people are saying, well, gee, you took down wall and you're building new. Well, we took down wall that almost didn't exist. It was like it was like paper. And we're replacing it with, in many cases, 30 foot uh, bollards. And in many cases, we're replacing it with 18 foot wall. But we have a lot of we have many miles under construction right now, and we're going to be signing contracts over the next couple of days for literally hundreds of miles of wall. And it's being built in the right places and uh, it's doing the job. It's doing the job. And it's interesting. It's like a little bit like water, as we do with San Diego. You know, California is very interesting because they keep talking to California. We don't want wall. I see a new candidate who's in the mix. He wants to take down the walls. Try that sometime. You'll see what will happen. You'd have tens of millions of people coming in. You see, uh, take a look at Tijuana. Take down that wall. You want to see a mess? Take down that wall. You'll see what will happen. Right now, we have thousands of people are in Tijuana trying to get in. They're not getting in. Uh, so uh, as we build it, it gets better and better, but it gets really to a point. And they come to a point, but you can control that point. And this is serious stuff. This is uh, we're able to do it cheaper, better. It's better wall. It's different from what you've been watching going up. We had to take the old plans. We didn't want to stop. So we took the old plans. We didn't like it. This wall is a, a beautiful looking structure. It's much stronger and you can build it faster and cheaper. Other than that, what can I say, right? It's uh, it's going to be great and it's going to have a tremendous impact. And on top of that, I have to thank the secretary and all the people that have worked so hard because what you do on the Border Patrol, what you do, what those patrol agents and what the uh, ICE folks do and uh, taking people out of the country that nobody wants to talk to. Even some of the sheriffs say, you know, if you can get ICE to do it, you don't mind if they do it. Right, Sheriff? As tough as you are. Uh, these are tough people and they're great people. These are people that the ICE folks that take such abuse from Democrats and some others, uh, they love our country as much as anybody loves our country. So we're building a lot of wall and we're taking good care of our people and uh, we're doing at point of entry a tremendous amount of work. We're already in contract to buy. Uh, they make pretty incredible new equipment for drug detection where you can find out what's in the wheel of a car, where it is, where it's in the engine, where it's in the hubcaps. I mean, we have some incredible stuff. Plus, we have also we're getting dogs, more dogs, believe it or not. I still say, is that still true? There's nothing replaces a good dog. Is that right? Buying yeah, yeah. this equipment for very expensive, but we haven't been able. It's true. We haven't been able to match the dog. I've seen out at Secret Service where they showed me the dogs, certain types of German Shepherd, very specific types of dog. But uh, what they do is they'll run by 15 boxes, all empty, except one, and they'll be very, very strongly sealed boxes, and they'll come running full speed and stop like on a dime they know the drugs are in that box it's the most incredible thing so we're spending hundreds of millions of dollars on equipment but i will say this it's not as good as the dogs but as you know we're getting you uh so you can have the best equipment but we're getting a lot of dogs for the various entry points also so with that uh i just want to thank everybody for being here in particular i want to thank you folks because you have been and please say hello to all of your friends that have been uh with us really from from day one, what you've gone through is unthinkable. And I appreciate it. And you're strong people. You're strong and you're proud. And your kids are, you know, looking down on you right now. And they're, they're very proud of their moms and their dads. You know that, right? They're very proud. Thank you very much. And again, to those Republican senators that did what they had to do yesterday, I want to thank them. They're very special friends and very special people. And they want to see borders that are strong, 
where we don't allow drugs and crime and all of the problems coming into our country. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Mr. Thank you. We see today, we see today white nationalism as a rising threat around the world. I don't really. I think it's a, a small group of people that have very, very serious problems. I guess if you look at what happened in New Zealand, perhaps that's a case. I don't know enough about it yet. They're just learning about the person and the people involved. Uh, but it's, a, it's certainly a terrible thing. Terrible thing. Yes? Mr. President, for the, some of the Republicans who voted for this resolution today, they support border security, but oppose executive overreach. Do you have sympathy for their position? I do. I look, they're doing what they have to do. And um, uh, look, I, did, I put no pressure on anybody. I actually said I could have gotten some of them to come along. I said, I want you to vote your heart. Do what you want to do. I'm not putting any pressure. I'll let them know when there's pressure, okay? And I told them that. So when I need your vote, I'm going to let you know. I didn't need the vote, because we all knew it was going to be a, a veto. And they're not going to be able to override. It's going to go very quickly. And uh, we have a great, as, as your attorney general just said, the case is a very strong case, very powerful case. It was, I think, actually, national emergency was designed for a specific purpose like this. Absolutely. So we have a great, we have a great uh, case, and I think it's going very, I mean, Ideally, they shouldn't even sue in this case. You want to know the truth. They shouldn't be suing on this case. But they will because they always do. We want border security. We want safety. We want no drugs. We want no human trafficking. Okay? And I'll just one follow-up on New Zealand. The, the killer in this tragic incident wrote a manifesto, apparently. Did you see that? I did not see it. I did not see it. But uh, I think it's a horrible event. It's a horrible thing. I saw it early in the morning when... Uh, I looked at what was happening in New Zealand. I just spoke, as you know, to the Prime Minister. I think it's a horrible, disgraceful thing and a horrible act. Okay, thank you all very much. Thank you. Well, there you have it. The President of the United States issuing his first veto uh, more than two years into his administration. The question is, will it survive on Capitol Hill? Uh, right now, he is confident, and he says that he has the votes to avoid an override. Who would know better than our Capitol Hill producer, Chad Pergram, who joins us now? Chad, what do you think? Well, the, the president seems to be right here, because if you take the vote uh, to overturn the national emergency in the House of Representatives, and that's where this veto override will go back to first, is the House, because that's, because that's the House of origination. That's where this bill originated, and that's how you do it under the Constitution. They would need 285 yeas. They came short by about 40. There were 245 yeses for that bill a couple of weeks ago. And so that veto override, and this is uh, you know confirmed here in just the past couple of moments, Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House says definitively that the veto override attempt will be on the 26th of March. Congress is out next week, so they'll do that first order of business in about 10 days. I'm going to read you part of a statement here that was just issued by the Speaker here. And she says, quote, House Republicans will have to choose between their partisan hypocrisy and their sacred oath to support and defend the Constitution. And, and Neil, what Pelosi is trying to do here is say there were only 13 Republicans who blo broke ranks last time and voted to end the national emergency. Can they try to put pressure on more? Now, that's a far cry to get, the, you know, 40 some odd votes. But can they make that an issue going into the, uh, the election in 2020 and say, are you really going to stand with the president and vote with him on these things? And they start to develop this compendium that they can turn around and weaponize these roll call votes against Republicans as we go into 2020. That said, Neil, I should point out that there were only three Republicans in the House of Representatives uh, right now who represent districts that were carried by Hillary Clinton. Is there any uh, fear among those dozen or so Republicans in the Senate, for example, who voted against this? The president had been praising those Republicans who did vote for them, and he said, I respect their decision not to, but was there a much uh, arm twisting going on? Yeah, there certainly was, you know, because they were trying to keep that vote under 60. They got 59. They switched uh, Tom Tillis, Republican senator from North Carolina, which was rather extraordinary because, you know, he had written an op-ed in the Washington Post saying that, you know, uh, what the, the reasons were, you know, saying, you know, we have to have a separation of powers. In an interview with Fox uh, in the hallway a couple of days later, he said, you know, unless I'm presented with other information. Well, Senator Tillis must have been presented with some other information here because he changed his vote right before. And I should remind folks that Tom Tillis has a very competitive reelection 
in 2020 in a swing state. The uh, convention in 2020 will be held there, and you can bet uh, that the Democrats are going to really turn up the machine against him because he flipped and stood with the president. Mm -hmm. That's where someone like Cor Cory Gardner, uh, you know, he voted also uh, to sustain the national emergency, and he'll get a lot of pressure too. That's a swing state as well. Chad Bergen, thank you very, very much. Thank you. Now let's go to Mark Morgan, uh, former Border Patrol chief under uh, President Barack Obama. Uh, Mark, good to have you back. What do you think of this? Look, the president is absolutely right. This is absolutely a national emergency, Neil. And this isn't based on some political ideology. I, look, I, I've been working for this country for 30 years in military law enforcement, lived on the border, worked on the border, worked the cartels. And the same thing, he had over... 200 years of law enforcement experience sitting behind him saying this is a national emergency. He had angel family sitting right there talking about the loved ones that have been killed at the hands of illegal aliens because of our broken laws and our open border. He's absolutely right. I stand behind this president. He is doing his job to protect this country. You know, Mark, I'm no lawyer, but I understand that a lot of lawyers are pouncing on this and planning to challenge us in any other variety of courts and that that will happen. What I'm curious about is when that is effectively challenged or a judge or a circuit court says you can't do this. Does that mean that whatever building is going on has to stop? I mean, what, what, what are, what, what's the strategy after that? Well, it could be, and I harken back to my law school days. So they could, uh, again, we, we've seen a lot of judicial activism in this country, lower courts setting national policy, and we've seen that again and again. And so they could win at a lower court and an automatic stay that could prevent some things. Uh, that's very possible. But I also think you're going to see this fast track to the Supreme Court if it's necessary, and I hope so, and I hope the president stays strong. What do you think of those who did not vote for this, citing some of those constitutional reasons, and it's a slip pretty slow, but no matter what party you're on, you don't want to give this power willy-nilly to any president. So I reject them voting the way that they did, Neil. And let's break that down really quickly. So they didn't do their job. They didn't listen to the experts, and they passed a spending bill that did not protect this country. And then when the president goes to do the job they failed to do, what do they do? They try to block him from doing that, and they, they quote constitutional reason to do so. No, they failed to do their job, and the president is, used, is actually using his constitutional authority of, of the national emergency as well as his veto party uh, power to do exactly what we should ask Congress to do. They failed to do it. The president is. All right. Mark Morgan, former Border Patrol chief under President Barack Obama. Thank you, Mark. You bet. Now to the retired Brigadier General Anthony Tata. Uh, General, good to have you. What do you think of what the president just did? I think it's a great move that the president's doing exactly the right thing. Uh, he's got a country to defend. Uh, his first duty is to protect uh, America and its people, and he's he's taken that uh, duty very seriously, and he's doing it by vetoing uh, this resolution. And so, uh, from a military point of view, Neil, what what a wall does is it uh, funnels uh, migrants to the uh, ports of entry and allows for more efficient use of border patrol and and other law enforcement officials and allows you to put technology in other areas that you know can look for the things that you know, human trafficking and everything the president pointed out the drugs and so forth and and we're kidding ourselves if we don't think there's a terrorist nexus out there there is one in venezuela right now uh with uh you know russia cuba and uh, hezbollah and iran and 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 they funnel up through central america and and they're pressing on our border and we're kidding ourselves if we don't think that uh, that's the case and you know it's our five yard line and, and you know we're okay going overseas and fighting the enemy on their five yard line you know it's it's time that we defend our five yard line to use a football terminology uh, as a general has served this country very bravely, sir. I'm, I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts are on the power this emergency declaration would also give the president to sort of go within the defense budget and, and, and take sure. monies from there, for example, that might be reallocated here. And, and, well, I, and how do you feel about that? I, I feel that it's an appropriate use of defense funds uh, to defend the border. Uh, our first uh, priority is to defend America. And uh, frequently, that's done overseas in disrupting ungoverned spaces like Afghanistan and Syria and Iraq, that uh, where terrorists can plan and, and uh, try to attack our country. But more importantly, now we we have detected there there is this uh, enormous flow of migrants coming up, and in those flows, 
our, our enemies uh, that uh, are trying to do us harm. And so it makes sense to move money, uh, you know, in, in a few billion dollars. You know, the president has boosted the defense budget over $700 billion, 718, I think, was last year. And so to take just a small fraction of that money and put it on the border makes complete sense to me. And, and the military will be able to figure out how to reallocate and, and make sure that the funding uh, gets to where it needs to be uh, when, when the gaps are opened as that money is moved. All right, General, thank you uh, very, very much. Uh, again, and to the General's point, the president, in fact, has boosted defense spending uh, if he gets his way. And it's a tough time in this environment to get your budget through. But he's proposed to bring that defense budget up to around the 770 to $780 billion area. Uh, the general is also just talking about terror. We saw the latest example of that. In fact, live streaming it. And why Facebook and other social media companies are really getting a lot of grief today for allowing their viewers to see. Just think about this, 70 minutes of terror in New Zealand, live and online. Suspect in that deadly attack actually live streamed it on Facebook. 49 people were killed at two separate mosques there. Social media companies are reacting, saying they can only do so much. Fox News Channel's Jonathan Hunt is with us now. Jonathan. Neil, it's a massacre that has left New Zealand and indeed the world stunned and on alert. It was an attack aimed deliberately at Muslims, a gunman live streaming every moment via a camera mounted on his head. We are not showing any of that video at this point, but I have watched it for the sake of our reporting, and it's important to describe the detail. The gunman drives calmly toward a mosque, playing music and talking to himself. He then takes weapons from his trunk, walks toward the mosque, which was filling up for Friday prayers, and opens fire, gunning down at least two men at the doorway. Then he walks inside and shoots every single person he can see. He reloads several times and at one point goes back into a room where two large groups are laying on the floor, many of them already dead, some wounded. And he walks calmly around taking kill shots, finishing off his victims with bullets to the head or body. Once he leaves the mosque, he shoots several people on the street, including a woman wearing traditional Muslim dress. She's wounded. She lies on the street crying out for help. The gunman walks up to her and once again delivers the final shot. He then gets back in his car, drives over that woman's body, and continues to shoot other people from his car. The video stops after about 16 gut-wrenching minutes and around 236 shots fired, all of it streamed live. On that point, Facebook told us today, quote, New Zealand police alerted us to a video on Facebook shortly after the live stream commenced and we quickly removed the shooter's Facebook and Instagram accounts and the video. We're also removing any praise or support for the crime and the shooter or shooters as soon as we're aware. Now, the man on the video also left behind what New Zealand authorities describe as a manifesto online. In it, he describes himself as a 28-year-old Australian citizen. He talks about intimidating and repelling what he repeatedly calls Muslim invaders. He says mass immigration is a threat to civilization, and he says he supports President Trump as a symbol of, quote, renewed white identity and common purpose, although not as a policymaker or leader. Neil, back to you. Jonathan Hunt, uh, thank you very, very much. Uh, Ed Davis is with us right now, the former Boston Police Commissioner. And Ed, if you don't mind, I want to go into this live streaming thing because when we were pursuing this on Fox Business earlier today, uh, the companies involved said, while well, they could take it down, if you have sent a video or shared this video with someone, it's another story. That can't be taken down. So it does sort of become viral on its own, even when the company does take it down. That raises an issue as to whether live streaming itself uh, is dangerous, because a lot of kids live stream, a lot of folks live stream, having nothing to do with it's like this. What do you think? Well, hi, Neil. This is a, tra a terrible tragedy. I, I, I've had a chance to see the uh, video as well. Um, when people take, uh, you know, new tools that are designed for uh, uh, good pur purposes and they turn them towards evil, uh, we have to rethink uh, our, our, our use of these things. And, and it's important to know that, that this is a, a tactic that was, uh, that was advised by ISIS. This, uh, 
this live streaming or, or videotaping of, of attacks, uh, as well as uh, the, the kind of brutality that you saw here and, and the uh, ideology that's expressed in, in the manifesto. Now, the uh, irony here it, is that this was a guy who was r raging against ISIS and extreme Islamic militants and the rest, but he did have that, 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 that wherewithal to, to show this. For what end and to what end? Well, it's for it's for it's for massive uh, shock. It's 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 to intimidate people. It's to it's to um, uh, make sure that his actions are broadcast far and right, wide. And you're right. This this video right now is widely available on uh, on online. It's impossible to put that genie back in the bottle uh, af after something like this gets out here. So uh, it, nobody wants to talk about censorship. Nobody wants to yeah. talk about limiting people's rights. But something needs to be done in these situations. You know, um, I don't know whether you think he had accomplices. I know a, a, a number of people were arrested, but I do remember, Commissioner, that you handled the Cernia brothers' attack, uh, uh, you know, in, in Boston, and you were helped by video and, and other that was everywhere that, that, that you could cull together and, and put two and two together. Do you suspect there's something like that there?